And welcome back to PCC Connection. I'm Michael Engel, your host, and I hope you've been enjoying this elongated segment of PCC Connection. Uh, it's certainly been one of the, the thrills of my uh, time here at PCC Connection as a host. We're visiting with some of the members of the USS Pueblo who are here in Pueblo for their 46th reunion. And I am here certainly with uh, another, uh, what I would consider appropriately here at the Home of Heroes, George Peppard, who was a cryptologist on the USS Donald. Pueblo. Donald, I'm sorry, Mr. Peppard. Uh, I got, I got a, after a while, I started getting some of those names mixed up, but Don, thank you. I appreciate you being here. And uh, uh, let me express as well, we appreciate your service on the USS Pueblo. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk about 1968 and, and uh, uh, some of the events that happened. Let me begin with this. How old were you in 1968? 30 years old when I first was captured. When you were first and captured? I had my 31st birthday. In, in captivity? Birthday. Yes. You had your birthday. Uh, I was just talking to Bob Chick as well, and uh, he turned, uh, I think he said 24, uh, in North Korea. Uh, let me take you to January 1968. And uh, you're a cryptologist, and you're working in the special operations hut, if you will. Uh, tell me about that day, or what you remember about that day. Well, actually, I was the administrator, oh, okay. and I had my own little office where I maintained all of the, the classified publications, yeah. and I issued them out to those that did work in operations. But the, uh, the day was relatively uneventful at first, and I, as a, I was an E6 at the time, a first-class petty officer. And so we enjoyed uh, early chow, if you will. Okay. And I'd done that, and uh, uh, everything seems to be fine. It's going to be a normal day on the normal USS day. Pueblo? And then all of a sudden, we, we had vessels approaching us. And at first, it was one sub chaser and, and two torpedo boats. And then another sub chaser and two more torpedo boats joined them. And one of the lookouts said we had MiGs flying overhead. So uh, it got a little exciting pretty quick. And uh, the, one of the sub chasers who seemed to be in charge was signaling Pueblo to uh, heave to. The signal was heave to or we commence firing. Well, heave to meant to stop, and we were already dead in the water. And uh, the only thing was we were not flying the National Ensign at the time. We had aerographer signals aboard, right. aloft, sure. indicating we were doing oceanographic work. But we raised our U.S. flag so they could see our nationality and they threatened us once again to heave to or we'll commence firing. Let, let me ask you at that point, you know, you probably had never had that particular experience before. You probably had some level of harassment. You had seen other ships, uh, maybe some Soviet trawlers or some Chinese junks or things of that nature in your time, right? Well, no, because that was the only ship I was ever on, and we were on our oh, okay. very first mission. Oh, okay, okay. But we had the sit reps from the USS Banner, who, which was the same type ship. Right, Ager 1, right? Ager 1. Yeah. And we could read her sit reps, and we knew she'd been harassed. Yeah. And we knew Russians had come close alongside and threatened to ram them but not do it. But you, you hadn't experienced that personally yeah. ever yourself. It's sort of what we expected if right. we were approached. But it got serious when they started firing at us. We knew that it was a little more than just harassment. If I ask you to recall when the North Koreans boarded the USS Pueblo, what, what do you remember from that moment? Well, I remember they, they'd made a couple of attempts earlier to board. And as they approached the ship, ready to, to uh, tie onto us and come aboard, the skipper would maneuver away. But uh, they were shooting us up pretty bad. And so finally the skipper uh, announced that he wanted the boats a mate and one deckhand to uh, report to the fantail to receive boarders. And uh, then, he, then he asked all of the crew to uh, report to the mess decks. And I was in that group at that time. Now some of the, some of the people who were running our engines, they stayed on, on station but the most of the crew packed into the, to the uh, mess decks. Okay. And I was, I was with them. In a, in a matter of hours, you were walking down a gangplank, a narrow gangplank, and you're on North Korean soil, blindfolded. Yes. What, what happened is they moved us forward from the mess decks to the well deck, an open deck forward. Okay. And uh, 
uh, they, they brought sheets out from one of the cruise compartments and they ripped them up into strips and asked us to blindfold ourselves, which we did. And then they took us below to the main cruise compartment. And uh, it was down as, as they took us out when we got into Wonsan, they bound our hands together at the wrist. So you're and blindfolded in. And, and also bound at the elbows to our body. And I could hear the script the ship scrape along the pier as we come in because they, ne they didn't bother to put out fenders or There's anything. Like no bumps, huh? But I knew that if you went across the gangway from the ship to the pier, it was a, a good little step or two to get across. Yeah. So when they brought me around the well deck and then one of the North Koreans put one of my legs up on, the, on a plank, just a board they'd put across. And then he put his foot in the small of my back and pushed me. And I fell off the board. Well, I knew I was going to land in the water, but we were so tight that I landed in gravel, right that close to the pier. And uh, that's your first step into North Korea. The first you step were into North Korea on the ground. Yes. For the next 11 months, Mr. Peppard, you're a prisoner of war, enduring torture and uh, what a lot of your shipmates have described to me as um, a constant battle between fear and boredom. And, and, and actually, uh, no information on what was yeah, going on any place else in the world. Uh, we, we did, uh, they did start letting us receive letters, which they read first. Sure. And if there was anything that would enlighten us, and then we didn't get those letters. Do you remember one of the letters you received? I don't recall receiving a lot, but I do recall a couple of the uh, shipmates that would get letters saying their brother died or those that they, they would get because they, they were to tear us down with the, that type of thing. But even with that type of information, was it, did it offer some hope to some of the crew when they got well, news from home? The longer we stayed there, the less likely we felt it was that they were going to kill us. But they were going to bring everything out of us they could up until they, they felt it necessary to let us go. And uh, uh, again, uh, I don't specifically recall getting any letters. Mm -hmm. And then they turned it around and they wanted us to write letters. They wanted us to write letters to public officials. And we were also allowed by their standard to write letters to uh, the family. And they would tell us, write whatever you want and it'll be fine with us. But I think we, by that time, we were familiar enough with, with their tactics to know that when we finished our letter, they would suggest some additional items right. to be in. So I wrote a letter to my dad, and the last line in my letter, I wrote, say hello to Garba Gefalo's father, and then I signed it. Well, say hello to Garba Gefalo's father. father. If you, if you re, if you recut that up, it says garbage follows father. <laughs> okay. Garba yeah, follows yeah. father. Okay. Garbage follows father. Gar yeah. Garbage follows father. And because I knew they were going to come up and suggest yeah. some other yeah. things to put in there. And so we, we wrote letters and I, I wouldn't write to any, to any officials. And for some reason they let me get by without doing that. In December of 68, you, it was a Sunday, I think the 22nd, the North Koreans called you into a room and informed you that you were likely going home. And then on the 23rd, you were bused to the Bridge of No Return. Tell me about that day, what you remember about the bridge. I don't no recall them specifically saying we were going home, but I do recall that every three months we'd get a change of clothing. And we were wearing winter clothing at the time and it was not time for a change of clothing. And what they did is they took us several crew members at a time in and issued new clothing, summer weight clothing. So they were not ready for this change of clothes. Right. So things like that started making us suspicious. Right. Something is afoot. And, uh, and you know, they gave us sneakers to wear and, and a, an outer, uh, an overcoat type thing, and a, even a funny looking hat that the we all wore, yes. Yeah. And so we suspected something was up. And then of course they took us and put us aboard trains. And it was not until we got to Kaesong, North Korea, that they, they, they told us that we were likely to be released. 
but up until then we, we were only speculating. And there was probably several other occasions there that we thought maybe we were taken to be released, but it didn't turn out that way. In a few days, you arrive in San Diego, California. Uh, do you remember? Well, actually, they released us on the 23rd of December right. across the bridge and no return. We spent the night at the 121st Air Vac Hospital in Seoul. The next day, we boarded two C-141 Starlifters, and we arrived in San Diego on Christmas Eve. And that's what I want to talk about. Uh, when you arrived in San Diego on Christmas Eve, uh, do you recall the reception you received? It was outstanding. All of our families were there. Uh, Ronald Reagan was there. Uh, other dignitaries from California. It was just such a, a great feeling to, and a great relief to most of us that we, had, we were back where we could be free again. And I remember so vividly, they put us on the old gray Navy buses to take us over to the, the Naval Hospital at Balboa. And from Miramar Naval Air Station at Balboa, the streets were completely lined with people waving flags. It was a great feeling. Subsequently, there would be a Naval Court of Inquiry and, and uh, we, we won't hash that out, but how do you feel about the government and how they responded to the USS Pueblo? Well, I, I think there was initial disappointment that they didn't do something on the day we were attacked. Yes. But having returned and, and uh, uh, you know, had our new found freedom, to, to uh, go through the court of inquiry was one thing. But to have it result in, in recommendation for court martial, that, that didn't set too well because we didn't feel anybody had done anything that deserved that. They, all of us were proud of the skipper, and uh, so we didn't think that was something that needed to be pursued. But, um, and each man was deliberately given an opportunity to testify so that later on they couldn't say, well, if I'd have been allowed to testify, right. it might have been different. So we all had our chance to talk to the court. And again, the, uh, the, the court's recommendations were to court-martial Booker. I think they wanted to court-martial Steve Harris, my boss, right. Lieutenant Harris, and uh, probably a reprimand or something for the XO. Uh, and, and that was as far as the punishments, I think, were, were going to go. And of course, before those things being carried out, they have to go through a convening authority. Right, it's kind of a lengthy process. They, they get adjusted yeah. along the yeah. way. But they ended up on Secretary of the Navy Chafee's desk, and he, he said, no, we're not going to do any of that. I think you said you guys have suffered enough. We've suffered enough. Don Pepper, thank you. I want to uh, appreciate your, your time with us here on our show. And uh, on behalf of the city of Pueblo, we appreciate your service as well. And uh, we really appreciate the fact that we can have a chance to visit with you. Well, thank you, too. You've been watching PCC Connection, a community affairs program brought to you from the campus of Pueblo Community College. This was a special out of the studio segment, and we've been very pleased to bring you several of the crew members from the USS Pueblo who are here visiting the city of Pueblo for their 46th reunion. And of course, we hope to have them back again. Uh, I'd like to say a special thanks to all of the crew and, and the wonderful planners in bringing the crew here to Pueblo. I'd like to thank the Center for New Media, Sarah Gama, our technician today, and Scott Richards, our producer, with the Center for New Media at Pueblo Community College. On behalf of the entire crew and Pueblo Community College staff and faculty, I'm Michael Engel, and we will see you next time. <laughs>